Okay, and we'll move on to the meat of the program. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to introduce Jessamine Wentz. She is a librarian in Vermont who presents all over the country and Canada. Um, she just got back from Montreal recently, so we're getting into the travel mode again, which I'm excited about. Uh, she speaks uh, on the intersection of libraries, technology, and politics. Her specific interests are the digital divide and its effects on library services, legislation that affects library services, and rural libraries using new technologies to make the most of their small budgets, spaces, and staff. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for... Uh having me testing out this hybrid uh, thing. We um, have been doing sort of a technology test as we've been going for the last like 20 minutes. And turns out my Bluetooth headphones don't actually work down in the basement where I am. And so I got backup headphones and man, if that isn't just sort of a metaphor for all of this, right? Like carry two of everything, expect to use both of them. So good afternoon and thank you for having me. Hello, New York. Uh, I'm Jessamyn West. I'm a technologist with a library background, and I'm in Vermont, not that far away. Uh, I was looking forward to coming to see you all in person, and this probably makes sense for now, but very nearby, similar weather, very different library systems. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on for the last two years in libraries, which, right? Um, this was definitely a year of learning and opportunities. And I say that kind of with a mm, face on uh, because I think I might've preferred to have learned a little less to be perfectly honest, uh, given my druthers. I think many of us were forced out of our comfort zones, uh, not only by our jobs, uh, but also the entire restructuring of the interactive parts of society as a result of COVID-19 virus and uh, a lot of people's quickly shifting needs vis-a-vis uh, -vis the library, right? And now we've got the same social split uh, in, a, in a different way, right? I've got a lot of friends who are starting international travel. Like I did go to Canada, but like I drove up one night and, you know, wore my mask for the entire time and stayed in the hotel and was very nervous and then gave a talk and then drove back home. So it wasn't really a vacation, but it was nice maybe to be in a city for the first time in two and a half years. Um, so I have some friends who are doing international travel and some friends who are still almost entirely quarantining at home. Um, and that's its own weird divide. And let's talk about that. So um, this main slide at the bottom, there's a web address, librarian.net slash talks, T-A-L-K-S slash CDLC, all lowercase, it's important. And you can see uh, citations for the stuff I'm talking about. You can see image credits for the turtle pictures and all the other pictures I use. And if you want to, you can read along with the slides. There's a link that says, you know, read all these slides on one page and you can kind of read along more or less with what this talk is. So I hope that helps either with accessibility or remembering it later or, reading along if you're actually watching this uh, recording later. So with that said, um, let's get started. And um, as Susan said before, uh, I've got the chat open above my slides. So if you've got like a quick question, something like, hey, what was that? Or what did you say about that? Or you typed 2014 when you meant to type 2020, which was the fix I made last night, uh, feel free to put it in the chat, but there will be time also afterwards for uh, longer questions or sort of how do you do this, how do you do that, whatever, maybe we can have uh, part of a conversation. So uh, when I was naming this program, uh, this, this, there's this concept, you know, computers all the way down, right? There's this concept that I think people are maybe familiar with. I'm not sure who is and who isn't, uh, but it's kind of an idea that I think about a lot. Um, at, there's a Wikipedia link on the list of links if you want to read the backstory. But in short, it's this idea. Um, you know, some people say it's from Hindu mythology. Other people say it's kind of a UK uh, uh, formation. The idea that the world rides on a turtle, or in the case of this picture, uh, you know, elephants on top of um, turtles. And, you know, the, the question becomes like, well, what's if the world's riding on top of a turtle, what's the turtle on top of? And the answer is, of course, like another turtle. Well, what about that turtle? Well, no, it's turtles all the way down, which 
obviously begs some obvious questions, but that's the crux for me about, and a good metaphor, I think, for working with technology in libraries, right? Someone comes into the library, uh, they have a basic question about email, they need to, they need to do a thing, um, but it turns out they don't know their password. Okay, we'll work on that, right? I know how to do that. Oh, but then it turns out they don't know the answer to their secret question. And in fact, probably think they don't have a secret question. What do you mean secret question, huh? Um, and then uh, in order to help with their email problem, you have to fix somewhere between two and 10 other tech problems. You know, maybe they have two-factor authentication turned on, but it calls the landline at their home and you're at the library. Uh, I'm sure that's relatable to at least some of us here. So, you know, it's kind of like that Carl Sagan quote, which is another one that I really like. Uh, you know, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, uh, the first thing you have to do is invent the universe, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And um, COVID made this phenomenon that happened before COVID uh, significantly worse, right? Because people who were already digitally divided. You know, they weren't very good at computers. They didn't feel comfortable with computers. Maybe they didn't have internet at home. Maybe they didn't have their own computer. They needed to use a library computer. And these people had more layers of technology between them and the things and the people and the stuff that made up their lives, right? There was technology in between their children and school. There was technology between them and their jobs. There was technology between them and, you know, picking up prescriptions at the pharmacy or getting something at the supermarket or trying to get something from Target or Walmart or very normal things. And, you know, I should mention at the outset, I kind of like learning things in a general sense. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons I, and in librarianship and not working in tech, not that tech people don't like to learn things, but it's different, right? Um, so being in this situation of enforced learning, as you can see on this slide, I learned a lot of cooking stuff. I learned a lot of playing internet games. I learned how to you know, attend huge virtual meetings through the American Library Association. Uh, I learned how to exercise outdoors in 10 degree weather, like all sorts of things, not in my tech life. And then in my tech life, I became kind of a Zoom hotshot, if I do say so myself. I learned a lot about Wikipedia. I learned how to order online from a million different places. Um, you know, I learned about TikTok, uh, all sorts of things. I don't mind that stuff, but I also live alone, didn't have a kid in school, and um, mostly was able to work from home. And so I was able to manage my personal situation pretty decently compared to people who all of a sudden everything kind of blew up. And a lot of people did not have my luck, or maybe they just don't like learning stuff, right? If you've got a bunch of hierarchy of need things, like you're hungry or you're worried about your housing or your car doesn't work, you can't get really excited about learning engine repair in the middle of winter when what you're trying to do is just, you know, get to work or sort of keep on keeping on. Um, you know, learning can take a backseat in those situations. So one of my main operating principles over the last couple of years with my work has been sort of least intrusive, but most helpful help, right? You don't wanna blow up somebody's life and be like, well, I know that your PC laptop is not great. So maybe now's the time you need to buy a Mac or whatever, right? Whatever the thing is, try and be as least intrusive as possible, but try to help somebody solve whatever they're information needs are, which in many cases include their technological needs, right? And also least intrusive can be a personal boundary. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, sort of later in the talk. And so I live in a small town and that star is literally the town that I live in. It's the dot in the middle of the state. Um, the town is big for our county, but it's also a very small state, as you probably know. And uh, COVID wasn't as much of a big deal here as it was in other places. It's a very rural place. We don't have places where lots of people congregate. We don't have big cities pretty much at all. Our governor was mostly sensible, which was nice. 
And, um, you know, he showed good leadership through this whole thing. And I'm grateful for that. But um, as my, um, as far as my work, you know, I used to do a lot of this only in person. And, um, you know, a lot of the other stuff I do is stay home and write and research and do digital divide uh, stuff. And um, I especially do a little thing called drop in time which I don't know, I just, they asked me what I wanted it to be called and it's stuck this way for the last like 15 years or so. And what that means is people come to the library certain in a certain time window, I'm hanging out and I'm not doing other jobs. So I'm not at the reference desk, I'm not doing CERC, I'm not doing programming. And they ask me their technology questions, hang out in the history room, anything at all. And technology is kind of loosely defined, right? Could be your phone, could be your camera, could be your laptop, could be your tablet, could be your smart watch, whatever the thing is. And we all try and puzzle it out together. And, you know, there's often multiple people in at the same time, or there were before uh, COVID. And part of the usefulness of drop-in time for the people who came to ask questions was people listening to other people and what their problems and concerns were or what they were having issues with. Um, I like listening to my drop-in time students talking to one another when I'm helping someone with a thing. So I could be helping somebody over here and I could see two people with iPads being like, oh, you have like an app that does puzzles? Like, tell me, tell me about that. And I often thought that was actually really good and really useful. So for a specific example, this is the room. This is the history room at the um, Kimball Public Library. Uh, and um, we're all gathered around a big library table. There's a big microfilm machine in the back. Um, and you know, these, this is kind of what we'd be looking like. So all the way on the left, that's Brian. Uh, he works at the local stove factory and also is a serious bird watcher. He's trying to figure out how to get Bruins tickets on his phone so that he can show the people at the gate. So like he's going to a Bruins game and he has to have a thing on his phone so that the gate people can scan it. Like there's no physical ticket. That's what Brian has. So it has to not just be something Brian mostly understands. It has to be something Brian can do or else Brian can't go see the hockey game, and it's important. Um, the person who is helping him with that is um, Elliot. And Elliot is my intern. He is 15. And Elliot is also learning some people skills because Elliot is one of those people who is very good at computers already, but he's not quite as good at what we call those soft skills, which is helping someone in a manner that's actually helpful to them not just kind of barking commands at them and being like, why don't you know how to do this? Right click, I said, right click. So part of what Elliot's doing is helping with the tech stuff, but part of what Elliot is doing is learning about the people stuff. So that's good. Um, in the back is Martha. Um, Martha's working on her anti-marijuana website on her ancient laptop. And uh, Sally, who is on the right, is trying to figure out why her calendar, which she has on her tablet, her phone, and her laptop, isn't updating in the cloud. And long story short, it was partly because it just updates more slowly than she would like. And there's a way to do a hard refresh and fix that sort of problem, right? And so basically, um, you know, most of the people in drop in time are older. Um, most of the people are working with older technology. And in many cases, people are working with multiple challenges, right? So maybe they have, uh, you know, dexterity issues, maybe they have vision issues. Um, maybe they've got a computer that's literally eight years old, and they're grumpy because the guy at the computer store told them they need to get a new one and grump grump eight is old. And you know, maybe they don't have internet at home. And so they have to do all of their technology work at the library in this room with a bunch of people talking. And maybe that's not perfect for them, right? So lots of different stuff. And, you know, I think uh, for a lot of us who've been uh, involved in sort of DEI work, um, 
lately, one of the things that we've learned a lot about is the idea of intersectionality, right? That like people may have multiple identities and that these identities, they may have different priorities of what those things are, right? You know, you're, you're female and you're Jewish and maybe you have a shaky hand. That's maybe different from somebody who's female Jewish, doesn't have a shaky hand, female Christian doesn't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea of intersectionality has really also informed a little bit of the work that I do because understanding that people may have multiple conflicting privileges and challenges can be a really good way to kind of understand um, why some of these things can be really difficult and or fraught. So March 17, 2020, which seems like a million years ago, but was just a little over two years ago, was the first day I remember so that stuff really kind of closed down, but it may have been sooner than that. Um, our library in town was open for a while um, by appointment uh, during part of the summer. Vermont had like a nice stretch there where things were going okay for us, uh, and then they weren't. Um, but then the library closed back down again as uh, the weather got worse and as the COVID stats got worse. Um, and then it opened again uh, in July and then uh, closed again in November. And, you know, this last winter, so 2021 into 2022, uh, our library was closed November through April. And I don't mean just closed, open by appointment, closed, wear a mask, closed, whatever. I just mean you can't get in the building we offer curbside and phone and uh, you know email reference, right? But nothing else. So people who were winding up having to have things be digitally intermediated and for whom that was already a struggle, so they were doing it for the food. They were doing it if they wanted to see a movie. They were doing it if they wanted to see their friends. Uh, were also having to do it if they wanted to interact with the library. And, you know, the library kind of closed quickly, so we weren't ready. I mean, I don't know if you can ever be ready, but we were definitely not ready. And, you know, as a result, a lot of stuff was a little the happenstance, right? And it was difficult. And there was a lot of scrambling to make sure uh, people could meet their basic needs. And as I said earlier, and, you know, I continue to say, every problem immediately became at some level also a technology problem, right? Like you can't connect to the Zoom that you need to for your job. Oh, maybe you have to update Zoom. Oh, I didn't know I had to update Zoom. Yep, well, you have to update Zoom. And, and they're not even at work yet. They're just doing the pre-work in order to get to work now. And so me, as the local technologist, without a bunch of other things that I needed to you know, handle, very lucky, um, became most people in my community who needed it, their local tech resource. Uh, so here are some of the things that I did. And one of the things that I think is probably the most interesting about this, when I reflect on it, is how much of this technological work ultimately wasn't really about technology. So um, I have four kind of steps, I guess, that were what we had to do, kind of hierarchy of needs, what we had to do in our community. So the first step when retooling to meet all these new challenges was just literally to make sure people had the internet in their house, right? Um, you may not know it right now, but I am speaking to you from the local newspaper office's basement, because where I live, um, my internet's fine for me, but it's not always fine. It's not reliably fine um, for work, right? So something like this, if I don't want the connection to hang up every five or 10 minutes, and like I come right back, but it's destabilizing, right? And it's not professional, right? So I asked around and I have this swell basement, which is really cool. I've got a server rack over here, a pile of cardboard boxes over here, but getting connected was the first thing. So for some people, um, it was literally getting internet at their home. We had, I think, four or six families in our community of about 4,500 people who didn't have internet at home and suddenly their kids had to go to online school. Okay, what do we need for them? Um, for other people, it was finding people in their support networks or in their 
sort of safety bubble, um, who would be able to help them if they did have basic things in sort of a COVID safe way, right? How do you help someone log into their iCloud account if they're not sure what they're doing and they can't get to the level where they can screen share, right? Um, we were really lucky in that mutual aid networks really sprung up in a lot of the local communities and some of them, including ours, were supported uh, by the local library, which was nice. So, uh, you know, the digital divide, as you probably know, uh, we used to talk about it as being like, some people have computers and other people don't have computers. And then we were like, some people have broadband and other people don't have broadband. And then we were like, some people have access to broadband, but still don't have broadband. We're not totally sure why, let's figure out how to work on that. And it's tricky. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a couple slides. But one um, part of people not having the internet was people just couldn't afford it. Right, and you guys are having a presentation in a little bit talking about how to help your patrons who can't afford the internet but get access to lower cost internet. Uh, a lot of tech companies, you know, the DSL companies, the cable internet companies, the fiber companies uh, often poo poo the idea that, that money is the issue, claiming people just don't wanna be on the internet. This is convenient for them, but uh, hasn't really been my experience. Um, and research also, if you look at the list of links, there's a great study by Colin Reinsmith, who's a great digital divide researcher, talking about how it's really not the case that people don't want the internet. It's just often confusing and hard to get low cost internet compared to just calling up Comcast to be like, I'll pay whatever it is, just come over and hook me up, right? Um, and it's one of the problems of the emergency broadband benefit, which we got thanks to now having a favorable administration, which is nice, um, was designed to address. And one of the other resources on that list, the um, National Digital Inclusion um, Association, now I've forgotten what A stands for, but NDIA um, has a really great page on their website. They're kind of an advocacy organization helping libraries and other groups with digital divide issues. And they have a page that talks about like how to get low cost internet, where it comes from, who's providing it, um, all that kind of stuff. And it's very helpful because not everybody, I mean, especially if you're not online to begin with, can get online to figure out how to get online, right? It's, and so one of the things we found when we looked into this in our communities, the families who didn't have the internet was, uh, there were logistical issues in many cases. Um, it's a very rural area here. There's like a village, but then a lot of people live kind of up in the hills or whatever you call it. And uh, we had one family that lived up a half mile driveway, like no big deal, it's just a driveway, but it was long. And there was internet at the road, but in order to get internet from the road to the house, you had to find a person to dig a trench, right? So it wasn't just, okay, we have to find some money for these people so that they can get this. We had to find money and a guy or a lady or a person who could dig a trench to the house. And trench digging is expensive. And um, we had to find that person, pay that person and figure out how this would all work. And so we leaned on our networks. People made phone calls. They organized the screenshot that's in the lower... Uh, corner of this slide is the Randolph Area Mutual Aid Network. Website's not the best, um, but it worked and that was important, right? In fact, we've been having uh, recent conversations with the Randolph Area Mutual Aid Network, trying to figure out what you do now with this website, now that we're not in the middle of a crisis, but we're in kind of the long tail end of the crisis and people still need help and people still need services. And, you know, what, what's the plan and who pays for it as, you know, COVID money sort of dries up a little bit and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, the other thing that we, uh, the other thing that we did is um, phone calling and wasn't just about computers even. So I'm one of those like Gen X people who don't really love the phone and uh, I'm lucky in that I don't mostly have to use it. And it doesn't really work well at my house, so hey. Um, but for most people, for many people, 
especially digitally divided people, it became a real lifeline, right? You got a lot of your information when you couldn't meet people face-to-face -face through the phone if you weren't great at email or texting or whatever. And uh, we had a rural library here in Georgia, uh, Vermont, who figured out who the library kind of frequent flyers were, and they just made phone calls to people who couldn't come to the library, who were at home, like, hey, how are things going? Did you know that the library has whatever, eBooks, curbside service, curbside printing? Uh, one of our libraries in the Northeast Kingdom had like during the nicer weather, like a computer that they put facing out in the window of the library. And so you could walk up to the library and use a public access computer without coming into the library. Like, you know, people, people found a way. And one of the things that they found, and it was interesting because I mentioned this on social media, which I, because I was like, oh, this is really cool because the community was really, really responded. A lot of people on social media, many of whom are like me, are like, Ugh, I wouldn't want to have to make phone calls for my job like that. Like that, doesn't that harass people? Don't the privacy policies keep you from having to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was interesting seeing the different response from within the community, largely positive, to people from the outside, eh, mixed feelings about this, right? And one of the things the Georgia Public Library found was the frequent flyers actually weren't all older people. They had assumed they were going to be, you know, the older people in the community, that the library users, the heaviest library users were also the oldest people in the community, the retired people, et cetera. And they just found that that wasn't true. There was a lot of different kinds of people who were library frequent flyers. And many of them appreciated the call that said the library was still there for them. And from an accessibility perspective, um, I have a friend, Marion. Marion is very hard of hearing. And she told me about caption phones. And caption phones are a thing you can get. You can read on my list of links that sort of talks more about it. But essentially, it's a phone that you can use like a phone. Somebody can call it like a phone. So they don't have to call a TTY number or anything like that. And the phone will show you what's being said on the little screen. And honestly, I, I'm not sure. And Marion wasn't sure, you know, it, it, does somebody help transcribe it? Is it just uh, artificial intelligence? I mean, like I know the stuff that comes on Zoom that if you have the captions turned on now is artificially intelligent, which means sometimes it's very intelligent, sometimes it isn't. But in this case, um, for Marion, she told me about caption phones because they were a game changer for her. And it turned out I could tell other people about it and became kind of a point person distributing this kind of information um, that was useful. And people with access to a phone, even if it wasn't a captioned phone, even if they weren't great at using online tools, could also contact ABLE. This is our state library for the blind. ABLE stands for audio, braille, large print, and eBooks. Uh, they do a lot of stuff over the phone, as you might expect. And they have books in tons of different formats. You know, they have, they have the players, they have magazines, they have braille stuff if you read braille, et cetera, et cetera. And I wish more people knew about this service because, you know, it can really, again, be a lifeline. Like I find technology a lifeline that keeps me in touch with a lot of my friends, my workmates, et cetera. And for a lot of people who, you know, really like reading and miss out on reading, the technology isn't complicated or it's not as complicated as you might think it is. And, you know, that's good news. And actually one of the things that happened during COVID, we had a lot of really good leadership from our state library, which I appreciated. And then our state librarian left uh, our state, but now he's the director of the National Library for the Blind, Jason Broughton. And so I'm really hoping one of the things that they wind up being able to do is really effective outreach for people who are what we call print disabled and could use this, right? So still very low tech, but connecting people with resources. And speaking of ABLE, uh, this is a tweet from just a couple days ago, and I promise this isn't all like things I learned about on Twitter, but one of the things that was the fussiest was figuring out accessibility tools on all the different teleconferencing apps. 
right? So you got Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, Hangout, like whatever Google cha chat. I don't remember what it even changed into. I use it. I don't know what it's called. Um, Skype, a whole bunch of different um, teleconferencing apps. The accessibility features are different for all of them. And uh, Zoom, uh, which we're using right now, and I think was a lot of people's sort of platform of choice, actually got sued in December of 2020 uh, because they had live captions. Again, the AI stuff that you see at the bottom of the screen, but they were only available to premium users, meaning paid accounts could get captioning which like makes sense as a value add and then does not make any sense at all as a really, you're gonna make people pay extra for accessibility features? Hmm, not a good look really. And so they got sued and they made live captions available to all accounts, but it's actually kind of a headache to enable them still. Um, and they don't work in breakout rooms. So if you're doing kind of a big event where people move into breakout rooms, uh, people who are hard of hearing can follow along with the captions in the main room, and then they go into a break room and breakout room, and all of a sudden there's no options for them. Just terrible, right? So you remember Marion, who I talked about before. She um, is a patron at my library. She's a patron at many libraries. She's one of those ladies. And um, she was attending Zoom book groups. Uh, through my library, and those book groups didn't have captions. And some people were in congregate living situations, so they were wearing masks. And Marion was just like, I can't, I can't, like, I can't follow this. It's very frustrating for me. And so she asked the library staff, and, you know, I'm the lady that does drop in time partly because I'm the person who's good at computer, um, but also because a lot of the other people at my rural library are not that great at computer. No big deal. They're great librarians, right? But, you know, Marion had said, I want captions enabled. They tried like reading the help files and following the steps and sort of trying to figure it out. And they were like, it doesn't work the way they say it should work. We've spent months on this. We give up. And uh, Marion, who's, you know, kind of a spitfire, like she's, she's, a, she's an advocate for hearing impaired uh, patrons, you know, asked me if I would try. And I not only did what my library had done, but I did uh, a thing that they didn't do, which was Googling the support forums, or I use DuckDuckGo, but looking at the support forums, trying to figure out uh, what, might, what might be useful, figured it out, made a blog post that explained how to do it. It was one of those things where like one thing only shows up when you click another thing. And so if you go looking for that thing before you click the first thing, boy, like it was, ugh. And, you know, if public libraries are as they should be uh, for everyone, if we have accessible bathrooms and elevators, lifts, ramps, we should also have this kind of stuff down. Right, But I also respect that my library staff have a limited amount of time for doing tech support with all the rest of their things. And at some point you've got to kind of cut bait if you're not able to do the thing, right? So this thread is also linked in my list of links. And um, it's a really interesting uh, thread of different people, mainly hearing impaired, but not entirely, just talking about the frustrations they have getting teleconferencing software in in order to do the ones um the things that they wanted to do so technology between you and the thing you want to be doing and so the question i keep coming back to you know when helping people when when looking at problems with dealing with uh people at drop-in time and what their what their issues and concerns were i was often asking and re-asking this question. Can someone not use their computer or are they just having trouble with the mouse? Mouse is hard, right? Like I got used to it, but like, you know, moving just the one finger or just the other finger when you're also doing this and you have to hold it in place and blah, blah, blah. Like there's a lot going on when you use a mouse. And so some people would think, oh, can't use computer. When it turned out they were just having mouse trouble and maybe a trackball or a touchpad would absolutely solve their problem. Or 
Um, is someone bad at email or do they just use the computer? Do they need the computer's font size enlarged, right? Are they having trouble seeing what is on the screen and they need somebody to help them do that, right? Like on my computer, it's command plus plus or command minus minus and suddenly the font is bigger and it stays bigger, which is really helpful. I think on uh, PCs, it's control plus plus, control minus minus. Um, are they bad with the iPhone or maybe could they just use to learn dictation instead of typing? It's kind of a joke with me and my iPhone that like my sister who's a couple of years younger than me, texts, you know, two thumbs, texts for everything. Me, I always like hit the microphone. I'm like, hello, I'm the blah, 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 you know? And I don't, my thumbs are not good at that. I don't do that, but I use dictation and I probably use it every day. It's built into Android phones, iPhones, probably the Windows phone, although I don't know that much about Windows phones. And it's a thing that once enabled for tablets or phones, sometimes it helps people very much you know, interact. You can just dictate your emails instead of having to type into them uh, with, you know, thumbs on screen, tiny stuff, right? So how many of the technology issues that we deal with are actually just people not having the right settings or the right configuration for the device they have? And, and of course, people won't necessarily know this, but hopefully it's a thing that we can know for them. And so here's a, um, the trend, I guess, among all of these options was basically scaffolding, right? One skill, you get good at it, you practice it, it leads you to the next skill and maybe the next skill, right? And linking someone to a person with the skill isn't quite as good at teach, as teaching them the skill, but it can help get you there. So one of the foundational documents, and in fact, it's the top of the list of links on that page that I gave you, is a short list by a technologist called Phil Agri. He used to have a mailing list back in the, the 90s, maybe the 80s, actually, that talked about kind of basic technology things. And it's called How to Help Someone Use a Computer. And a lot of it is, you know, almost Cohen's about what, what the real job is, right? And so there's two short excerpts from it on this slide. So on the left, that's me trying to help John, who's at home, try to fix a corrupt Outlook file while my iffy internet threatens to hang up on me. And on the left, it's me and, or the right, the right, sorry, guy with the mask. Um, it's me and another John with his dad, Mel, Mel's 95, uh, Mel needed to get something notarized. And the laws said, you know, national, our state emergency laws said that you could now do notarization over Zoom. Great, safer for everybody, especially before vaccines. And Mel couldn't get on Zoom in order to be able to get a document notarized over Zoom. So his son who was in his bubble could show up there and get him on Zoom and we got it all sorted. So John, who needed help with Outlook, could probably have learned some techniques like Googling for support files, or maybe even made a phone call to tech support on his own. Um, John, with the, with the dad, was the human connection who could help that. And he could help Mel take the steps that Mel needed to solve his problems which you know the problem Mel had was not technological, but there was a technological doorway that he had to go through in order to get there. And so knowing the difference, who can help themselves, who is always gonna need some help is an important part of the work. And I think we're kidding ourselves if we believe that we're always gonna be able to train people up to a level where they will all then be able to do it themselves. I don't mean to be negative about it, but I just think assuming some of this is gonna be ongoing support is I think a more realistic approach to working with people in technology and figuring out where that support is gonna come from. So second thing that I think about when I think about this problem is learning the actual tools, right? Uh, I showed you some in the last section and 
Here's a few more, and you'll notice, again, a lot of them are analog. And the most important part for me was taking things down to the basics. If people are comfortable with email, try to funnel things through email. Send a tech support link, send a Zoom link, send a link to connect with you. Um, some things required in-person attention when our in-person options just weren't available. Uh, you know, I have some cases where like people wanted to get rid of a laptop, but they wanted their hard drive wiped, right? And they didn't know how to do it. And if their computer is the only way to connect, you can't give them the steps for wiping the hard drive because once they've gotten to the wipe and hard drive step, they're not in touch with you anymore. Um, people had a new iPad and they needed it set up. And so we would do some actual technology drop-off service, kind of curbside, kind of garage side, depending on sort of where people were. People would call the library, they'd email me, we'd start a conversation. And so it was a little bit less, hey, come by the library between two and four, which is what drop-in time was, and more, why don't you explain your problem to me and we'll see how we can connect and figure out how we're going to help. And so recognizing both in 2020 and some of 2021, less so now, that people more than usual had time. Not all of them, some of them. Um, and that in all but the most dire emergencies, we could do kind of slow motion scaffolding and not have to fix things all at once. So we'd send home handouts, instructions, maybe a PDF if we thought somebody could print it, maybe actually just a piece of paper in the mail that would explain how to do a thing, how to search the internet. This is an older uh, handout. You can kind of tell by looking at that picture, but you know, good information for somebody who doesn't really use Google or DuckDuckGo. They just know something they do on their phone conducts a search, but maybe if they want to do a specific search, they don't actually know how to, how to do that. And, um, and then we'd circle back. How did that go? Were you able to find the thing? This was like the main thing I learned in library school that I think we don't talk about as much anymore. Like a lot of stuff, like the reference interview and you know, understanding the basics of cataloging and you know, some of the programming stuff and you know, services to special populations. I feel like librarians still talk about that a lot. And the thing that I learned that was most important to me that isn't talked about as much is this concept of circling back, right? You have like an information storage and retrieval system, you try a thing and then you evaluate the thing. Did the thing do what I thought the thing was gonna do? So searching Google, I think a lot of us, you search, you do a quick scan of the, the results. Did I search, did I use the right words? Did I, did I get stuff I wasn't expecting? You know, was I trying to search for George Clinton and everything I get is Bill Clinton? And then sometimes you go back around and you do it again, right? with your more information. A lot of the work libraries and librarians do is iterative. You build on things, you know, you scaffold, et cetera. And I think for a lot of our patrons, that concept, what do you mean you do the search and then you do the search again, seems weird. And a lot of times if we did this, hey, here's a handout, let me know how it goes. Uh, novice users often would feel bad if the advice we'd given them hadn't worked, right? They often blame themselves. And it was often sort of a delicate conversation to try and figure out if they were where they wanted to be, not just, well, I gave you the handout, hope that was good, see you later. Um, so this picture is Ronnie, my landlady, she's in her 90s, and she had a new laptop with a trackpad that worked differently than her previous trackpad. And, you know, she's in her 90s, like she was doing fine, but, had trouble kind of remembering the difference. And so I actually just did a little handout that's like a sketch of what her trackpad looked like with arrows that pointed to what the things were and she could keep it right next to her computer. And if she had a question, she could take a look at it and not have to, you know, have weird things happen that she didn't, that she didn't really understand. One of the things I hear a lot about um, from drop-in time students is, you know, why don't things have manuals, right? I'm sure you have heard this same thing. And 
you know, when you then tell them, well, they, they do have manuals, it's just that the manuals are PDFs. Again, one more, one more turtle, one more computer all the way down, like one more step in between them and learning the thing and then figuring out how to get the PDF. How do you print the PDF? How do you, et cetera, et cetera, starts up a new branch of support. And one of the things that I think is the most challenging is a lot of the people that I deal with in drop-in time often want a list of steps. You do step one and then you do step two. And what they wind up with is a flow chart. Like if you're at the desktop, double click on something, something, something. But if you're in a program, you can start by doing file new. And that, that whole if then thing, it's destabilizing. And I'm not 100% sure there's anything you can do about that, except explain to people why it's the case. But it really is why you know, sending an email is different from baking a cake. And a lot of people wish it were otherwise. I sympathize, but again, the only way, the only way out is through, right? And so the other thing um, for things that have a lot of fiddly setups, and I mentioned before, um, the thing with Zoom was a lot of the controls you would have to click on weren't visible until you clicked on the previous thing in the list of things to do. Um, Gmail, I don't know if people use Gmail here, but Gmail is like the classic with this. And you know, I understand this from a design perspective. You don't want to show everybody the 300 things that Gmail does. So you kind of hide things so that people only see them when they need them, right? You can't delete an email. And in fact, you won't even see the delete option until you've selected an email or you're inside an email, either one, but that's confusing, right? Or printing. Like, where's the print button? Well, you have to be looking at an email. You click those three little dots and then you see the print thing after that, or you can look for the little printer in the corner. Oh, that's a printer? Exactly, right? So figuring out how to give people a sequential list, a, a way to explain to them first this, then that, a lot of what I did um, is, uh, created, again, handouts, first this, then look for this other thing. I'd write long emails that would have the instructions with the pictures in line, and people could keep those emails if that worked for them, or they could print those emails if that worked for them, or if they were looking at something on their computer that they both didn't understand, but also maybe were having a hard time explaining, um, I'd have them take a photo with their phone, again, not everybody has phones, but more and more of my uh, patrons have either smartphones or a dumb phone that can take a picture, sorry, feature phone that can take a picture and send it to me. And so, you know, sometimes people could use Zoom or Skype screen share options to show me what they were seeing. Um, Windows Remote Assistance for, you know, Windows 10 and Windows 11 users works great. And you know, I'm not a hot shot in like every teleconferencing tool screen sharing options, but I could usually use Google slash DuckDuckGo, you know, how to screen share with Skype and get something decently accurate fairly quickly. And one of the things that's really useful to be able to do if you're helping people not in person, somebody has a question about a thing on their computer at home is uh, making uh, being able to explain to them how to take a screenshot from the computer that they're on. And that's one of the things in my list of resources, because it's one of the things I used so much more than I was expecting to use. Take a screenshot, email me the screenshot. Take a screenshot, print the screenshot, bring the screenshot to the library. Doesn't matter. But being able to take a screenshot for me meant that I could make handouts, circles and arrows, et cetera. And for my patrons often meant they could show me a thing that they were having a very hard time explaining. And sometimes people would have a situation that maybe I couldn't help with if I wasn't going into their homes. And that was also kind of an early drop in time decision that we made in my library between me and you know my library manager was you don't go into people's homes and do tech support. 
right? Like this was pre-COVID, but just it's just not what this is, right? If people need that, they are going to need to talk to somebody else. And we could try to connect them with people who would do that. And it's difficult in a community, but we had to kind of draw some boundaries against around what the library would pay for and um, what the library uh, what the library was sort of willing to do. But sometimes people would have um, you know, a screen they were trying to describe and you tell them to click on a thing and it wouldn't work for them or whatever. And um, you know, maybe there was something at home, maybe a device, this phone uh, can't be fixed remotely, right? And it was helpful for people to have the problem somewhat you know, bounded and understood, but then often they'd have to call tech support themselves. Right. And man, people did not want to do that. And I don't blame them. Tech support is frustrating. You know, it, it can be frustrating to talk to people who are like talking you through a list of steps when that's not what you need or who don't understand you or who you have trouble understanding. Um, and, you know, drop in time would sometimes highlight what I call and what Wikipedia calls like the streetlight effect. Right. It's that joke where like the guy's looking for his keys somewhere underneath the street light outside somebody comes over what are you doing look for your keys in this one area oh great I'll help you look well actually I lost my keys over there well why aren't you looking over there well the light's better here and I feel like a lot of people want me to help them with a thing because they like me and they like the library and they don't want to talk to Comcast who's our cable provider or whoever else uh and, you know, part of what I would have to do is kind of gently redirect. We would talk through how they would talk to the tech support people, what vocabulary you need to use, what's the information you need to have to be ready for your talk with the tech support people. Maybe even I would be available over text, you know, from somewhere while they were talking to the tech support people. So like this phone specifically, this is uh, Sharon, one of my drop in time patrons, one of her phones and something's wrong with the screen, right? She sent me a picture of it. And I was like, oh yeah, that's not a thing we're gonna be able to fix by turning it off and on again. There's something wrong with it. You're probably gonna have to call Apple. Here's what you should tell them. You know, this is your lock screen. What you are seeing is, you know, this and that. You tried turning it off again, that didn't work. Like, let's see what the issue was. And it turned out there was just something wrong with her phone. She had to get a new phone, it's hard, but sort of true, right? And so patience is a huge part of this. And, and patience isn't just being able to like count to 10 while somebody's sort of explaining all the problems that got them to what's wrong with their computer right now. But it's often really honestly believing in your own mind that this is work worth doing and that people learn at their own speeds and also in their own ways. One of the things that I think I like the most about this work is remembering how many different ways there are to do computers and seeing the creative and inventive ways people use them to solve problems once they can get them to follow at least some basic instructions, right? I've, I've forgotten what it was like when computers were just full of endless possibility, you know, where you were like, oh my gosh, I can use a computer to whatever, right? Manage my smart home, manage my, you know, organizational thing, figuring out how to have these group conversations with a bunch of people, interact with people from all over the world. You know, some of that I do, some of it I don't do, but that, that, that idea of endless possibility, um, I enjoy that energy with people and oftentimes, you know, the trade-off is occasionally hearing kind of a long sob story about why, why this, why that, et cetera. And so this is another Phil Ager quote, you know, you forgot how many things you assumed that the interface would be able to do for you. And that's useful to remember when you're helping somebody else. And so third thing, a lot of my work isn't really computer work at all. I happen to be good with computers and that confidence that I can just fix the thing um, helps other people get more confident and feel like maybe they too can 
fix the thing. So it's helping people get incrementally better at a task or a skill that's challenging for them. And the psychological aspect of it, I think, can be what differentiates, you know, a library tech person from the average person who is good at computers, right? Because, you know, Elliot from the slide earlier, Elliot's great at computers, but he's not great at talking to people, listening to kind of what's wrong and helping formulate a plan that's good for them. And, and that's fine, right? He's 15. That's absolutely appropriate for Elliot. But it is worth knowing that many times young people like Elliot grow up to be older people who continue to not be great at talking to people who are nervous or afraid or sad about their relationship to technology. And so part of what we do is a lot of like, you know, you can do it. You know, we have empathy. We can use that empathy to help people feel better about their interactions and not just learn the interactions by rote, but feel that they are actually knowing what they're doing. And that is part of what keeps people moving forward. So I, I alluded to this earlier in the talk, um, but a digital divide concept that I feel is really helpful is this idea of digital readiness. Uh, Pew internet people uh, put this together. They've done some research. It's you know several years old now, but I think it still holds up. If you want to read more about this, there's a link to this uh, larger report on my list of links. Mm -hmm. um, so people need not only the skills, right? You got to know how to click and double click and navigate and, and read a page and see where the next button is, knowing when to act. Um, but you also need to be able to get out of a problem. You need to be able to troubleshoot. Okay, I tried this and that didn't do it. So I'm going to undo this and try this other thing you know, formulate a help question for Google or DuckDuckGo, look for a help forum that can talk about your issue and then follow the instructions. So you not only need those things, which are skills, but you also need kind of the emotional um, aspects to it. You need to be able to trust. You need to be able to trust in yourself. You need to be able to assess the information that you're getting to see if that's sort of accurate, if that's working, um, et cetera. And you need to know kind of when to say when and figure out, uh, you know, I need help versus sort of, I don't need help. And, and sometimes that's also important. It's as much telling people about what they don't need to do. You know, you don't have to upgrade your McAfee. You don't have to use Google Drive to back up your hard drive. You don't have to, like all these things that your computer is trying to kind of coerce you into doing, you don't have to say yes to that. But the companies, you know, the advertisers who are kind of trying to subtly nudge you, you know, if you say no to a thing, you know, that pops up a lot of times, it's not even no, it's like, yes, I'll do it or not now. That enrages me because, you know, my answer is no, not maybe later. And I just, I find it very vexing, right? So, you know, do you need to pay for virus protection? You don't. Uh, do you need to use two-factor authentication for your email account? You don't. It's a good idea. It's better for privacy. It's better for security. But if you don't have a cell phone, maybe it's actually not solving a problem for you. In fact, it's creating one, right? Do you need to upgrade to more expensive DSL package because the one you have isn't working? Uh, no, probably not. Uh, maybe they just need to fix the product the DSL that you have. Should a tech support call take two hours? Almost never, it usually shouldn't. One of the things you know I hear a lot from sort of digitally divided patrons is, oh, I was on the phone with tech support for two hours. And I'm just kind of like, how did that go? I mean, you know, trying to sort of figure out what are the things that are leading to this, because obviously no one wants to call tech support if it's going to take two hours out of their day, but how do we figure out how to make that a better situation for them? And how do we encourage their own trust in their own skills and knowledge? No, I don't need to do that. Yes, that's probably a good idea to kind of help them. And so this is an example of why this is uh, important. This is an image of an email, a printed email, uh, that one of my drop-inners got. So uh, she, because of some reason, had to make a phone payment for an overdue phone and uh, DSL bill, right? 
So she had to pay over the phone where normally she would have, I don't know, sent a check or done something else. So she got this email back from the company just saying, hey, we received your payment. Um, we haven't processed it yet, but we've received it. We just want to kind of let you know. And had this weird little GIF at the bottom or JPEG. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but it basically says, you know, in kind of a handwriting font, thank you for choosing CCI with a little smiley face. And like, it's weird, but there's a lot of stuff that's weird lately, right? And so to Connie, who was my student, it looked fishy, right? And her kids, Connie's probably in her 70s, maybe 80s. She lives alone. And her kids are always yelling at her, like, don't get scammed, mom, like, blah, 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 blah. You've got to be more careful, blah, 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 blah. And so taking other people's warnings to heart and not being confident in her own assessment, she called the phone DSL company and asked them, do your confirmation emails have, you know, this little smiley face at the bottom of them? And they're like, what? No, but they probably don't know, right? So they connected her with the fraud department at the telephone company. Do your emails have a smiley face at the bottom? What? No, but also they probably don't know. And so Connie still feels vulnerable and she feels more vulnerable now because everyone's like, no, that didn't happen. Um, she goes to the bank and she talks to their fraud department and that fraud department, because they're in the business of fraud um, and they see how these things go wrong every day, suggests closing her entire bank account and opening another one. Um, and she does that and it's a hassle, right? And it's all over this goofy email signature. And I looked at this e email and I'm pretty sure this email was legit, right? But Connie did what she thought was reasonable to do to try and figure this out. And, you know, the system kind of let her down. And, you know, the other problem with this situation was, you know, all she did was open the email. It wasn't like click here, log into your account. Aha, we've got your passwords, which is actually how phishing works. She just opened the email and then she felt it was weird and she couldn't, you know, she couldn't say why maybe she thought it was threatening, but she could say she felt weird about it. And so as a result, you know, she incurred a great deal of hassle because she wasn't comfortable and she didn't get good advice from people. And, and that's too bad. So a lot of what I did this year was helping people practice, practice sending an attachment practice sending a text, practice Skyping, practice getting into a Zoom call. Uh, this is Shirley. Uh, she had a violin recital for a family member and she didn't wanna show up kind of not knowing what was going on, uh, not knowing what she was doing, right? So we worked on first things first, straightening out her camera, um, but also learning to turn her camera off. She didn't wanna be on camera. Um, and then after we learned to turn it off, we turned it on again. And then, uh, you know, we learned how to mute, how to unmute. And we practiced so that by the time she had to do it in a real situation, she had confidence and a little bit of trust that she would probably be able to do her own thing. And, uh, you know, maybe other people wanted to use their phone to do a thing like, hey, my friend told me there's an app for, you know, listening to bird calls. But when I look for bird call apps, I found 6,000 apps and I don't know which one my friend is talking about. And so, you know, they wanted somebody to help them and be like, hey, I think maybe it's this one. Do you wanna try uh, getting it and let me know if that's the one your friend wanted? Because you can look at apps and figure out which ones are popular, which ones are well-reviewed, which ones are by sort of big companies. I can tell that, but my patron maybe couldn't tell that. Oh my gosh, I downloaded so many apps this year, <laughs> um, just trying to help people get the apps that they needed. Puzzle apps, bird apps, outdoor exercise apps, Zoom, Skype, Teams, Hangout, Meet, Chat apps, uh, all of them. But, you know, I could get a lot of screenshots. I could email them to people and, you know, wind up being kind of time well spent, I thought. And so lastly, uh, all of this stuff really only works if people know you're there. 
I made a lot of friendly videos that went out in the library newsletter. I posted how to ask a good tech support question posts on the local mailing lists. Um, I let the local mutual aid networks know that I was a person who could help people with computers, even people who were really having a hard time. Um, when I was notarizing things for people, which I did a lot of, because the combination of like, am a notary, can you Zoom to do notary stuff is smaller overlap than you might think. Um, let people who I was notarizing for know that I could help with other things. Um, my library wasn't super tech savvy before COVID and in some ways that was challenging for them. But in other ways, it worked well for what the community needed. Um, I did some learn about the internet classes uh, for a library that was in the next town. Like, what are some fun things you can do online during COVID? And, uh, you know, the next town is 900 people. We did this class in February, 2021, and it was their first online event at the library. And so, you know, everybody kind of connects to this at their own rate and their own, and their own level. But it's been gratifying to see that that library actually has been doing a lot more virtual programming since. And um, libraries also statewide worked together in ways we hadn't before, which was a weird side benefit I wouldn't have expected. Um, you know, we have a State Library Association website, vermontlibraries.org. Uh, there's a link to this uh, calendar that's actually on my list of links. And a lot of our online programs we realized could be attended by anybody, right? didn't have to be people in our geographic area. And obviously if you pay for that, you don't want it swamped from people in other towns, but most of our libraries are tiny and they have tiny programs. And the bigger deal is just getting people to show up at all sometimes instead of worrying about having uh, too many. And so, you know, we opened up geographical access to a lot of our programming. We wound up having a statewide calendar for programs in the area and it was a great way to serve our communities. And so people in those tiny communities, like you know, over the mountain, that tiny community of 900 people, if there were people in that town who wanted online programming and their library wasn't there yet, they could have access to it uh, through VLA, which was cool and kind of fortifying for our state library association who really had a lot of work to do this year and or the last couple of years and was happy that there were things they could do that made a difference. And I think really the second to last thing, the thing that made this work the most useful for me personally was having reasonable boundaries and figuring out what those were before I was sort of confronted with them. So no, I'm not gonna call tech support for you, but I will coach you how to make that phone call. No, I'm not gonna type up a letter for you, but I will teach you how to use dictation so that you can practice doing it yourself. No, I can't tell you what kind of computer to buy, which is a question I get a lot and is awkward because, uh, um, but I can tell you which ones will meet the specifications and give you some suggestions where to buy them or where to find you know, good sort of deals on this. Understanding when to refer people is kind of an important part of this. And you know, the thing we say a lot of times in kind of self-help spaces is, you know, self-care can be a little bit tired, but it's also important. And, you know, put on your own oxygen mask before helping others means that you can stay fortified so that you can continue your work another day, right? So this is my last quote from Phil Hager. Uh, I think about people like Marion and Shirley and Ronnie and Mel and Brian and Martha and Sally and John and other John. And Connie, and you know, each person who comes to drop in time or who gets help from the library to just get one step better at using the computer, they help the other people in their communities, their friends, their family. Uh, maybe not even people who come to the library, right? Maybe not even technology people. And every time we say, yes, a thing is possible, or hey, that's a thing you can do or hey, together we can fix this, the more we're helping people, all the people in our community, whether or not just this particular cataclysm, but potentially others, which builds resilience at the same time as we build skills and confidence. And so that's what I've been doing this year. 
last year, chunk of the year before. And um, I'd be really interested to also hear about what you all have been doing. So thank you very much. You can contact me over email on Twitter. And again, the notes for these slides and most of the words that I was just saying, uh, you can find online and they're all available uh, via Creative Commons license. So feel free to use and repurpose as you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions or comments, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can call on you if, um, as we learned from the presentation today, some people like to type, some people like to speak. Uh, so whatever format works best for you. Uh, I did, I had a question myself, uh, kind of related to the boundaries, your boundaries slide. Uh, and it is um, kind of a time management question. I went to a program last week about, um, the digital navigators being run through NDIA and been talking to some people in our libraries. And they've found, you know, through the through this period, the questions have been coming, becoming a lot more in depth. And they're, you know, sometimes they'll spend an hour, sometimes they'll spend two hours with people. And how do you manage that, you know, with, while you're still doing your day-to-day -day library work? Well, I mean, sometimes it's a really good idea to have it kind of built in how, how much the library is prepared to do, right? Like maybe there's one set of how hard we're gonna work on this problem for you know library programs, like we'll work this hard to get you on Zoom so that you can attend our you know, book group or whatever. But maybe for something that's just kind of a personal technology issue, you know, maybe we've got appointments that are 15 minutes or half an hour or whatever it is. And with the with the understanding, and this is a very awkward part of it, that often, you know, the, the hardest to serve people are always the hardest to serve, right? That people often have challenges, intersectional challenges. You know, maybe they've got cognitive issues. That means you have to do things over and over again. Maybe they've got... Um, motor skills issues, which means it's really difficult for them to type or, or use the touchpad. Like one of the things I've enjoyed about drop-in time is often we can kind of get somebody started with the thing and then be like, okay, why don't you try typing this email? I'm gonna help so-and-so with the thing and we'll kind of circle around. I think sometimes, especially in smaller libraries, we can get kind of trapped by someone who has kind of a well of endless needs, right? Regardless of what that is, like even if it's library stuff, but you know, people who either don't have that kind of built in boundary of like, I'm interacting with a shared resource. And so I need to, you know, I, I need to be able to kind of stop at a point, even if like me, the patron, even if my problem isn't fixed. Um, I feel like sometimes it can be good to have um, like social learning time, like the same way you might have like knitting group or something. I, at one point, several years ago, uh, did a thing that was just called laptop time for, I mean, it wasn't specifically for older patrons, but it wound up being mostly older patrons, but everybody would just come. We'd hang out in a room together back when that was a thing that we did a lot. And people would just kind of come with, a task they wanted to work on. And it wasn't, and I was there, but I wasn't there to help them specifically with a thing, right? But I had an hour or two hours or an hour and a half plus snacks to be in a room while people worked on their project to be able to help them with that. But at the end of the hour and a half, if they needed more help, they could either come to laptop time in two weeks or show up at, um, you know, a sort of a drop in time session, because one of the hardest things about just this work generally is having to break it to somebody that they need more than the library can give. But one of the things that I also think is really important for libraries is only being able to give what you have available and not, you know, you're probably familiar with this term uh, that is sort of a thing in libraries, but the idea of vocational awe like we do this job because it is a calling and we come in early and we stay late, even if we're not paid for it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because the work's important. And don't get me wrong. I love the job and the job's important. But 
does that mean every problem that somebody comes into the library thinking I should be the one to fix it? Again, the spotlight problem, right? People like having me help them with the thing because I'm nice and the guy at the computer store is not nice. On the other hand, sometimes what you have to do is help someone learn to talk to the guy at the computer store. And so the hardest thing about this, I think, is having boundaries and knowing when to say when and knowing how to say when in an appropriate way. And in smaller communities, the hardest part of this, I mean, I have one woman who I've helped who lives in kind of a congregate living situation. She's got some de developmental challenges. You know, she's got a social worker and I got connected to her through adult basic ed. But what she really wants is someone to kind of sit and give her a one-on-one -on -one iPad class every week. And that doesn't scale. Right. And she doesn't quite understand that that doesn't scale. And I sympathize. And so part of what I do is work with other services that people have. Right. You know, social services. I talked to her social worker and I was like, look, she can't attend these Zoom events if she requires somebody to be there to connect her to Zoom at the beginning of these events we need to find a way to make this work, but maybe that's not gonna get fixed at the library. So connecting people with resources in order to do that, being able to friendly let people know, because the other flip side of this is just, you know, people who are just well off and they believe the library's free help and they like saving money, respect, right? But maybe they wind up kind of crowding out other people because they're not sharing in the way they have to. So some of it comes down to sharing. Some of it comes down to ways that you can maybe um, use economies of scale to help multiple people at the same time, working with wraparound services to help people get access to things that they might need more help than you can give. And sometimes it's identifying other people in your community who can maybe be available to help somebody in a way that, um, in a way that the library staff specifically can't, right? Like maybe you have like another person who's not even library staff who does a drop in time thing and it's a program the library can oversee, but it's not one that library staff have to spend their time with when maybe they're only open 22 hours a week and they just don't have two hours to spend on the thing. So it's complicated and there's no easy answers, but those are kinds of the ways I think of that problem. Muted. Thank you. Um, do people have other questions or comments about how they've managed these sorts of issues uh, throughout this pandemic, things they've learned in the past two plus years that they would like to share with the rest of the yeah, I'd be really curious at what people's, you know, library hacks were that they found. Like for us, curbside printing was a thing that we just did because we felt like we had to, and everybody was in love with it. And we'll probably keep it up, right? It keeps people from having to use the public access computers to do printing. It's pretty straightforward for us. You can send something to print in the middle of the night and have it waiting for you when you get up in the morning. It's kind of win, win, win. I'm, I'm always curious what other people in other libraries have found that, you know, maybe they're going to keep with them. I do know my local library has said they're going to keep um, online book groups uh, because there are so many people that are, they don't want to go out at night or they, you know, they don't have time to get to the library and people have really enjoyed the online book groups. So that is definitely one thing that's staying. How about anyone else? Anyone in the room here today? We have a few people in our room today and we have, um, I, don't, I don't have to make it follow the mic, but we have a camera that can <laughs> follow you if anyone here wants to comment. No, okay. Oh, here we go. We have someone saying online programming will continue. We also added a drive-through as a permanent service point. I do know some libraries have had a lot of drive-through drop-offs, like so much so that they have to have they've had, they have to build they have to build multiple containers <laughs> to put the things in because they can't empty them fast enough. So that's 
uh, a cost and a parking lot issue that I think they weren't anticipating prior to this. Uh, well, and my library is, I don't know about, you know, the ones you guys do, my library is not super accessible. Like there's a huge flight of steps, you know, eight or nine big steps and incredibly heavy door. And then we also have a ground level kind of ramp access and kind of a clunky elevator, but doing sort of curbside and, and we don't have any parking. Like we just have street parking and it's parallel parking, not the best, but being able to do, um, you know, drive up service where somebody can hustle out and toss something into your car. Like we don't want to do that for everybody, but for the people who have challenges, whether identified or not identified, you know, we don't make you identify, but like trying to be able to kind of meet people outdoors so that they don't have to like get out, wrestle with our terrible doors and everything else. It's, it's really been great. And I'm hoping we can sort of keep some, like, I don't make those rules, but like, I'm hoping we can keep some of those things up because I really think they do make the library more accessible. And while a lot of being closed made the library significantly less accessible in some ways, yeah, we're keeping at least one of our online book groups. And now that it has captions, Marion can go and she's thrilled. Um, but sort of thinking about that, what will probably keep the statewide events calendar for people who are comfortable opening up their event to the larger state, you know, we don't find where we are that library programs are just overrun with people. And so it's better to make them available. Oh my gosh, one of the libraries near us did like, uh, like an online pet show event when we were actually all closed down in early 2020. And so everybody could like bring their pet and like jam it up in the camera. And then there was a bunch of judges and, you know, everybody got some kind of prize for something. But like those kinds of things where you engage kids who were like home and bored and just, uh, you know, you get people talking to each other, you get people getting to know their community. And you know, I don't think we would have all chosen to be hurled together in this way over the last kind of two years and change, but there were some real community opportunities is so trite, but like opportunities that came out of it that the library or some of the libraries in our state at least became a real uh, focal point for it. And it was cool to see that happening where it worked. Any other comments or questions for today? That is one thing about um, remote events that I still have to get used to. It's so hard for me to judge um, what people are thinking or planning to do in the, in the audience. Uh, so I don't, but I don't see any in the chat and I don't see anyone raising their hand. If you're raising your hand and I don't see it, you can put it in the chat. Um, so without, so unless any come up in the next few minutes, um, I, we can close off. I will be sending out an email shortly with information on how to get a continuing education certificate for today. And I will resend the um, page of links. There's lots and lots of information on that page um, that Jessamine put together for us. So I will send that out again later today. So look for that. And um, we also have been able to offer things throughout the state. Our sister library councils um, allow members of CDLC to attend the, most of their remote events um, around the state. So those are on our calendar. So if you go to cdlc.org and go to the calendar, you will see more things, more continuing education than you could ever take part on on there. So I encourage you to go look and um, check it out sign up, most of them are free. And if you are looking for something that you don't see on the calendar, let me know, susan at cdlc.org. And we will try to get an event together for you if you, uh, if you think you would be a good speaker on a program, let me know that too. Uh, and we would love to have you. So I'm just gonna check one more time. Looks like a lot of thank yous are on there. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.